Welcome to Seacoast, especially if this is your first time or visiting, you're very welcome. Stay on and have some fellowship and a cuppa after. We're going to do communion at the end of Jim's word this morning. He's going to bring that a bit later. So Bronnie and John and the children can uh, go out now for Sunday Children's Church. (laughs) Just get this flyer. Just have a few announcements. Um, Ladies, in about three weeks from yesterday, we have a, a ladies' curry and soup night. This is an outreach. I encourage you to invite and bring someone along that doesn't know Christ or is on that journey. Um, I'd also ask if there's some good cooks and you have a special soup or curry that you'd like to bless the women with as well, then please see me or Bronnie after this. Um, I'd really appreciate some extra cooking. And they're always special these nights. So that's on June the 19th at 6 p.m. here. And it'll be a great night and I have two lovely ladies sharing their testimonies, powerful testimonies that will um, really touch hearts, I believe. Um, So I'll invite Jim up. He's got a few more announcements and the word to bring. Good morning, everyone. So good to get up here and see all these amazing faces. So Vanessa's mentioned the Women's Night. Um, The last couple of Wednesday mornings, there's been a group of people meeting, you know, we've been talking about um, setting aside Wednesdays to somehow connect with our community in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, we've identified that uh, there are many out there that are feeling alone, lonely, isolated, not connected in anywhere. And um, so we want to create a place of community. And uh, so that's what we've been working on the last couple of weeks. And we've probably, we've got at least one more meeting about that this coming Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. And if you'd like to be part of that or just come and find out a bit more, you're very welcome to come. Um, So that's that's, uh, Wednesdays. We actually have decided on a launch date for this new ministry and outreach. And it's going to be the 23rd of June. And we'll be open here as a cafe from 9.30 till 12, 12 o'clock. Um, so we're moving forward with that. Next uh, Sunday, there, we're holding a barbecue here for a fundraiser for this a new ministry. Um, and so come prepared to buy a sausage sizzle or hamburger or whatever's going, going at the time. Um, so that's happening next Sunday. Trevor and uh, John are, are kind of setting that up. But they, uh, they actually asked if there's anyone who would like to help them with the barbecue um, and, um, you know, help in some way in that fundraiser. Please see them uh, this morning. John and Trevor, do you want to just stand up where you are so people know who you are? I think most people do. Great. Thank you. So see these guys if you want to help out with that. Um, Also, because, you know, there will be a few expenses involved in setting this up. Actually, I'm really good on my heart to have a computer um, we've got Wi-Fi here, so have a computer set up for for those who don't really have access to that and who might need it. Do you know to access agencies, Settlelink, whatever? Um, that um, we can have that available for people. So I'd love to buy a, a computer or a laptop for that. Uh, there are other expenses as well. We're not charging people um, that morning. We um, anyone can give a donation on the morning, but we we want to make it so that there's no hindrance for people to come and enjoy. Uh, a morning. Now also, you know, there may be many of you here that you think, well, I can't be here on a uh, Wednesday morning. You know, you're working, you're running a business or whatever, uh, but, you know, your heart is for this church to reach our community. Now we've got um, end of financial year coming up and uh, we're, we're going to run this program under our registered charity, which is called Global Care. And if you would like to give a donation through Global Care to this ministry, we can give, we can give you a tax deductible receipt. Um, so Julie, Julie will be down the back um, this morning uh, at the FPOS machine. If you want to go down there, she's already got some receipts she can uh, write out for you. Otherwise, you know, if you send it during the week into our bank account, 
put on their global care, make sure that we can identify who you are and we can give you a receipt uh, later on. But you know, if you're if you're running a business, you know this may be or you know this may be an opportunity for you to to sow before the end of the financial year um, and have the benefit of um, the tax deduction as well. Uh, so please have a pray about that. Our next worship night is going to be Thursday night, the 10th of June. Yep, Thursday night, not a Wednesday. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. Also, um, we, you know, we we. To be honest, we're starting to get a little bit crowded in here. Some Sunday mornings, not so bad today, but um, we have kind of tidied up the cafe area again and got a, a few tables out there. So after church on a Sunday morning, uh, if you you know if you're going to get a coffee or you just want to go and have some go into a different space, you can actually wander out there and um, there are a few seats uh, out there. You can sit around the wine barrel if you want to on a stool. Uh, but there's a few seats out there. So we can spread out, is, I guess is all what I'm saying. After a Sunday morning, we can spread out. We don't have to be confined just to, into this area. Is that good? Good. Let me, I just want to pray before I bring the word this morning and pray over our finances. Lord, Holy Spirit, you're the one that we look to in everything, you know, in all the decisions that we make about life, about finances and you know, everything that pertains to our life. And, and so I pray, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts about our giving, you know, whether it's our tithing, whether it's our giving of a donation, uh, whatever it is, whether it, you know, in all of our financial affairs, Lord, that you would guide us with wisdom, that you would help us to be really good stewards of everything that you've provided for us. So we pray, first of all, over our giving, over the finances, particularly in this church, Lord, that that, um, that there would be more than enough, Lord, to accomplish everything, every good work that you've called us to do. Lord, I also pray over this word this morning. I pray that you would touch our hearts, you would stir our hearts, that this word would be, you know, as we bring the word of God, it would be a sharp, two-edged sword that pierces us and divides, you know, truth from error um, and uh, that we would discern what you're saying for us personally, as well as a, for us as a church. So we give you all the thanks and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want to get straight into it. Um, I haven't got any fluffy stories to tell. Uh, so we're going to get straight into it. But who is ready this morning for the Word of God to bring some clarity, some strength and some power to your life right now? How, does that sound good? Yeah, good. <laughs> Great. More than just a couple of people like usual. <clears throat> um, I want to I start off this morning with a couple of quick examples that speak into the heart of my message this morning. Um, but let me just say, first of all, I want you to be expectant. Be expectant this morning. If, you know, your expectation and faith will draw out God's word as it speaks to your life and to your circumstances. If you don't expect anything much this morning, then that's exactly what you'll get. Not anything much. We don't want that. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament. Um, I'm starting just sharing briefly with a few stories. The first one is about uh, the story of Elijah the prophet. And now, um, you know, these Old Testament prophets, they were way ahead of the game. Way ahead of the game um, with the things of God. And the situation is that King Ahab is on the throne in Israel. For 22 years, he is the king over Israel. But it says in 1 Kings 16.30, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. What a pathetic and tragic testimony for the one who is head over all of God's people, over Israel. Ahab was married to Jezebel, who worshipped uh, a foreign god, another god, Baal. And she had her own prophets um, um, under her. She was a nasty piece of work. Revelation, and now we can think, oh, well, that's just an Old Testament story. Revelation speaks prophetically to the church in the end times and warns about the woman Jezebel corrupting the church. But this is not a woman. This is an evil, unclean spirit. And men are just as susceptible as women to the influence of this spirit. 
Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, I have a couple of times in my time here preached on the spirit of Jezebel. And I, I actually love doing it because I love exposing the devil's strategies. Anyway, that's, we're not doing that today. But it's just interesting that Ahab, the leader of Israel, finds himself married to Jezebel. So it came to the point where God spoke to Ahab through Elijah, uh, that as a consequence of his evil, no rain or dew would fall upon the land from that moment on. Now, I'm condensing the story, but after three years, with the land being in drought, it's in severe famine, Elijah finally puts an end to it. But only after an incredible display of, of the power of God on Mount Carmel, where the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed a water-soaked sacrifice. It's a, an amazing story. And after that display of the one true God, Elijah killed all the prophets of Baal, all Jezebel's prophets. But then comes the bit that I really want to highlight this morning. In 1 Kings 18:41. It says, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. Remember, this is in a time of extreme drought. At this stage, there is not a cloud in the sky. It goes on in verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And so he went up and looked and said, the servant said, there is nothing. And seven times Elijah says, go up again, go again. Now, I love this. I, you know, this pretty much sums up the theme of my message this morning. Elijah, having confronted the prophets of Baal, which means in itself, you know, a monumental spiritual battle, having proven that the God of Israel was the only true and mighty God, powerful God, and, and having then slaughtered all the false and evil prophets, like, you know, it's a big day, uh, he then lifts his eyes. Actually, he doesn't lift his eyes. He doesn't do that. He puts his head between his knees. But in the spirit, he was lifting his faith and expectation to see what he knew God was about to do. He kept telling his servant seven times, go back up to the top of the mountain and look out, to, out towards the sea. Because he could hear, he could hear the sound of rain coming. He could hear the sound on, of an abundance of rain. And then uh, verse 44, it says, Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud the small, as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up and, and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Jezreel was where Queen, Queen Jezebel was and she was about to meet an horrific end. But my point is this morning, when the battle is raging... And evil seems to be so prominent and so pervasive. And it seems like we are living in such a drought and a severe famine in some shape or form in our lives. Where are you going to place your faith and your expectation? That is the question of the day. What sound are you going to listen for? The sound of defeat? The lies of the enemy? The influence of false prophets and naysayers, the voice, voices of negative and faithless people, or are you going to listen for the sound of an abundance of rain, an abundance of the living streams of, of the water of the word, an abundance of healing, an abundance of provision, an abundance of peace? What voice are you going to believe? The voice of the Spirit? And the uncompromising word of God, or the voice of un uh, sorry, the voice of unfailing truth, or the voice of negativity and hopelessness. Hold that thought. Put a line under that. Here's another Old Testament story. I hope you love it. I hope you love this as much as I have loved preparing it. Look at what God did with Abraham. Abraham was an old man, and Sarah and his wife. 
She was old as well. But not only was she old, she was barren and unable to have children all of her life. And Abraham was distressed because he had no child of his own to pass on his inheritance. Not only to pass on his land and his possessions and wealth, but that the spiritual inheritance and the lineage of his family and of his faith, it was so important for him to pass that on. You know, God had spoken to Abraham and promised him an exceedingly great reward. But Abraham couldn't get past this blockage of not having a natural heir. He thought everything would have to be passed on to his household servant, who was not part of his lineage. He couldn't see past the obvious natural circumstances. In Genesis 15 verse 4, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he he brought, brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven. And count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So, this is really exciting. I'm excited. (laughs) I hope it catches on. So we have Elijah able to hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Even when the natural earth was dry and desolate. And we've got Abraham, who was able to see that his descendants would be as great in number as the stars in the sky, even though his natural circumstances were impossible. But he believed in the vision God gave him, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. One last example David is now the king of Israel. And he is facing an enemy, the Philistines, who have come after him. In 2 Samuel, David asks God if he should go up against the enemy. And God says, yes, go up against them. The Philistines are beaten and it becomes a place of tremendous um, breakthrough for Israel. In fact, he names that place after, break, as, as a break, place of breakthrough. And the Philistines then gather themselves together again. And David says to God again, do we go up against, against them this time? And in 2 Samuel 5, it says this in verse 23. Therefore David inquired of the Lord and he said, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Giza. What a strange thing for David to have to listen for, the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. But that's exactly what he did. And God opened up the way again for a great victory, significantly enlarging Israel's territory. I believe God is speaking to us this morning. But will we hear it? Will we allow our expectation and hope to rise above our natural circumstances and the things that we hear and the things we see with our natural ears and our natural eyes? If we are willing to trust to believe, to persevere in faith, to listen and to look for the signs that God is showing us, we will be well positioned as a church to step into the next move of God, the next demonstration of his mighty supernatural power. Yes, come on. But not only that, this applies to our personal lives as well. There's a sound of an abundance of rain. There's a multitude of stars in the sky, so great that we cannot count them. There's a strategy for this season that is perhaps unique as God, uh, that God um, is is more, more than willing to reveal to us. And it may be something as unusual as hearing the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, 
nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. They have not entered into our hearts. They have, we, had, we don't see or hear, we, we, we don't know what the future really holds. Um, but God has prepared something for us. We, we, we were declaring our love for him this morning. Um, and we do love him. And he has, he has great plans for us as the church. I believe God's word. Do you believe God's word? I believe in the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I believe in hearing things and seeing things in the spirit. And I put those things above what I see in the world around me. This world can carry on like a pork chop. It can call black white and white black. It can call good evil and evil good. It can call light darkness and darkness light. But that will never change the truth of our true identity and our destiny in God. He is the author and the finisher of life itself. As the New Testament writers refer back to Abraham and his faith, they make the point that Abraham's story is not just about allegiance to the law, but about the gift of God's grace upon his life. Listen to what it says in the Passion Translation in Romans 4.16. It says, The promise depends on faith so that it can be experienced as a grace gift. And now it extends to all the descendants of Abraham. Who's the descendant of Abraham? All of us. This promise is not only meant for those who obey the law, but also to those who enter into the faith of Abraham, the father of us all. That's what the scripture means when it says, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our example and father, for in God's presence, he believed that God can raise the dead and call into being things that don't even exist yet. Let's, let's just pause there for a second. Other versions say that God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And, you know, we all know that this is not our normal Christian experience up to this point. Um, we don't generally see the dead raised. Uh, I know it's happened in other places. I haven't personally seen that. Um, or things being called forth that don't ex even exist. I mean, we have, we have seen some of that. Um, but, but why don't we see that now? Why don't we see it more? Why, don't we, why aren't we living this life, this supernatural life, as, as I believe we should? Is it to do with the promise? It's not to do with the promise. The promise is true. Or is it to do with our faith and expectation, even our desperation or lack of it? Could it be that God is bringing us to a point where we simply need to position ourselves with our head between our knees, like Elijah, and keep on believing and persevering and looking up? To look up to the heavens and see the magnificent and magnificence and the multitude of stars that cannot even be counted, and grasp the revelation of just how big and how powerful our God is. I, for one, am going to continue to believe for things that don't exist and call them into being. And as silly as it might sound, I'm waiting for the sound of marching to be heard in the top of the mulberry trees. Now, I don't even have any mulberry trees. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> In verse 18, it says, against all odds, when it looked hopeless, you know, and we could all finish that sentence off with our own personal experience at times. Against all odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word, and as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration over him came to pass. Your descendants will be so many that they will be impossible to count. And they will be, yeah, and, and in spite of being nearly 100 years old, when the promise of having a son was made, his faith was so strong that it could not be undermined by the fact that he and Sarah were incapable of conceiving a child. You see, Abraham didn't live in fairyland in a place of denial, he knew he and Sarah were too old to have a child. 
He was already living out that reality of what was impossible. But he also knew God. And he trusted him and he trusted his promises. In verse 20, it says, He never stopped believing God's promise, for he was made strong in his faith to father a child. And because he was mighty in faith and convinced that God had all the power needed to fulfill his promises, Abraham glorified God. I might be about to lift this sermon above a PG rating just right now. No, don't. It's okay. It's all good. But do you notice it doesn't say anything like the Holy Spirit came upon Sarah or some angel waved a magic wand over her? No, Abraham and Sarah did what people normally do to have a baby. They did what was required in the natural, even though the natural wasn't ever going to be enough. Isn't that interesting? You don't ever nullify your faith or the promises when you choose to deal with life in natural ways, especially when, you know, you hear from God. I've seen too many examples of God working miraculously in the midst of the natural course of dealing with things like health issues and financial issues. I see too often the strong connection between how we respond to something emotionally and intellectually and even physically and how that plays out spiritually. This is all about positioning ourselves on all levels, all levels of our life. After all, we are made body, soul and spirit with a mind, a will, and and emotions. We are whole in that way. And we might not be of this world. We're not of this world. We're passing through. But we are certainly living in it. And whatever brings glory to God, do it. So, you know, whatever you... The leading is... We're still being led by the Holy Spirit. We're still being led by, by what God's saying and what He's showing us. But sometimes He uses the natural things of life to do that so we're coming into land now Romans eight nineteen says for the heart, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God this is another one of my favorite scriptures because actually it's what it's really saying is that there will be a revealing of the sons of God and the natural world the natural world is waiting for that And I love what the Passion Version says. It says the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Now, this picture of standing on tiptoe is is not just the universe and the whole creation that, that needs to be doing this. We, as the sons and daughters of God, need to be doing it too. We need to be standing on our tiptoes in expectancy of what God's going to do. That's expectation. We're going to be a vital part of the next move of God. Not for our own glory, of course, but for the glory of God. Because we can, when we are revealed, when God's sons and daughters are revealed on the earth, so Christ will be revealed, so the Father will, will be revealed, and so the Holy Spirit will be revealed. People will see the nature and the character of the Father. They won't just see miracles and healings. They, they, they will see God's goodness. They will see his faithfulness, his amazing love and grace extended towards them. And you know what? This is really what our, Wednesday, what our Wednesdays are going to be all about. Revealing to those who are alone, isolated, disconnected, broken, disenfranchised, those without hope. It's about revealing the nature and the character of God to them. He will use us. He will use you. You will be inadequate. You will be unworthy. And you will be insufficient. We won't be able to meet all the needs that come before us. But God is calling those things that are not as though they are. He is calling things that don't exist into being. He's calling every one of us to take hold of the vision that Jesus shared with his disciples. In John 4.35, it says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, 
for they are already white for harvest. Here it is again. What do you see? What do you see? Do you see, do you just see a hopeless world full of broken and lost people? You know, I, I struggle, you know, with the whole concept of us and the world. It's like, aren't we good and aren't they terrible? It's not like that. God sees everyone, everyone through the eyes of love and grace and mercy. What do we see? Or do we see a harvest of souls? Again, the translation, Passion Translation puts it beautifully. Look at all the people coming. I love that. Look at all the people coming. Now is harvest time. Their hearts are like vast fields of ripened grain ready for the harvest. That's what we need to see. Don't just look at the outside. Look at the hearts. Those that are coming in could be, they could be, you know, your son or daughter. They could be your mother or father. They could be your brother or sister. Parents and grandparents all over the place might be praying and interceding every day for the lives of, of their loved ones. And we might be just the ones who give them the opportunity to find Jesus. We can't do it though, but we can call those things that aren't into being. Look at the hearts like vast fields of ripened grain. Jesus saw them as he went to the cross. It was, you know, that's why he went to the cross with joy. It was with joy that he faced the suffering and death because he had us and, you know, everyone in this world in mind. I'm not asking you to do anything this morning that is not already in the heart of Jesus. Nothing that is not already written as a promise in his word. Lift up your eyes and see with faith and with expectation. See the harvest. See the star-filled night. Let it speak to you. Listen for the sound of an abundance of rain and the sound of marching in the trees. I know that you're all with me on this, but every one of us just needs to check our heart this morning. And if we have any negative, critical, unbelieving, stinking thinking, then we need to renounce it and get with the program, with, with Christ's program. We are heading for the next and probably the last move of God on the earth. It's going to happen spontaneously, just like it did at Pentecost. We might feel like we've been waiting forever, but when it happens, it will happen quickly. All we can do is position ourselves to watch and to listen and to respond. Keep our lanterns burning and the oil of anointing freely flowing. You know, the 10 virgins story. Keep our hearts aflame. What I'm talking about is, is you know, it's already being birthed. It really is. God really is doing a new thing. You know, the word says, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? We need to be able to perceive it. Get up on your tippy toes in the spirit. Be expectant. We're about to see an unveiling and we are going to be part of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. We're going to share communion together right now. I'm going to give you a moment to rip open those packages in front of you. I thought this was a very appropriate way to respond to the message this morning. I'd like you to um, take hold of the little wafer and uh, that little cup of juice. And we're going to remember what Jesus has done. And as part of that, we're going to remember and to give thanks for the fullness of life that we have been given to impart to others. Or at least what Christ in us the fullness of God has to impart to the generation that we live in. Receive this communion today where in your heart you are standing on tiptoes with expectation. In fact, I might ask you to stand.
You don't have to stand on tiptoes, but in the spirit, stand on tiptoes. Stand with expectancy, with faith, looking to the fields which are white under harvest. See the people coming in. We've been given this incredible gift of our imagination. I believe our imagination has always meant to, it's always meant to have been a faculty of the Spirit. People have used it for all the wrong reasons. But I believe this is a faculty of the Spirit. Imagine, see, in, see the people coming in. See the Holy Spirit transforming their hearts. See their hearts changing, going from hardness to, to hearts of flesh, soft, pliable. See the doors of the kingdom being swung fully open to them. We receive this bread and, bread and this juice for ourselves, but we receive it in faith for others to come in as well. This is the body of Christ broken for us and for the lost. This is the blood shed for the salvation and healing, not only of ourselves, but for those who are yet to discover eternal life in, in Jesus Christ. Let this this morning's moment of communion be filled with hope and expectation for the future. The world is in far lack of, of that, but our lives are filled with hope and expectation. As well as being thankful, so grateful for what, it, what was done 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. So let's take and eat as the body and the bride of Christ this morning in Jesus' name.